Good morning, meine Brüder und Schwestern. This is an Obrey Project investigative video series, Joseph Smith and Kabbalah Part 9, Back to the Old Ways. I'm your host, John, and it's said to be March 10, 2019. Uh, I beg all of you to forgive me. Um, I am on a at least twofold, if not threefold, uh, sort of tail end of uh, not only chemo, it's R chop chemo, for anybody who wants to look into that, but uh, the P in chop is prednisone. It's very heavy, it's sort of prednisone. It has to be done after the actual chemical injection portions for five days, 100 milligrams a day, five days consecutive, with no taper down. And uh, the reason it's R chop is because the rituximab is used to treat a, a blood issue called ITP. And the thing is, prednisone is and has been one of the most standard in uh, allopathic medicine for boosting platelets if you have ITP. So before you get chemo infusions, you have to have platelets up at a certain amount because the infusions can stop platelet production for a given amount of time. So, uh, this last time around, mine had dropped down to a super low number, which was, it's actually normal for me since I was diagnosed with this 20 years ago. And it doesn't matter to them um, <clears throat> whether that's normal for me or not. And uh, I think my ITP, based on many factors, is atypical. They have to use prednisone to bring it up again. So there was five days on that, a couple of days off for the infusions, then five days on again. I don't know if anybody out there has been on heavy prednisone for a long period of time. It's terrible. It's terrible. And not only is it terrible when you're on it, for a lot of reasons. Um, it can be terrible when you go off it for a lot of reasons. So besides like lingering half-life side effects and who knows what what else is coming from like just the art art shop therapy there's uh there's this exhaustion that you get to and so and it and and you're also experiencing those uh one of the the big not even side effects, man. One of the big effects of, of uh, prednisone is uh, you feel it's like your adrenal gland, you know, is going, going. Um, so if you can imagine that still hanging on, you know, and it affecting your sleep and other things, and you feel, you know, adrenaline, imagine the, the sort of bloating uh, feeling that you have in your gut and other things hanging on, but at the same time, this sort of uber tiredness crash all together. <laughs> That's where I'm at. So please be uh, be aware of that. I'm doing my best, and we'll get through it. Um, and there's one thing that I want to address before I'm going to uh, again go through. Uh, a scripture, and then I'm going to go into the last sections, the last two sections of this paper uh, by Lance Owens, a bishop in the Mormon Church. And uh, we're going to talk about a few things because we have, after this, we have a, <laughs> a what what proves to be um, a, a, a really amazing journey of of facts that we're going to put together, uh, things that 
certainly don't seem like they could be coincidence. A much bigger picture I see emerging in this, and, and who would have ever thought that I would come head-to-head uh, -head with Mormonism like this, because I used to say, um, concerning my other studies, geographic studies and eschatological studies, and what America has to do with that, I used to say that, uh, that LDS people that I loved LDS people, the uh, the architect, or uh, sorry, the uh, um, those who practiced in archaeology and, and artifact uh, hunting, <laughs> not in the same way that say Joe Smith was into treasure hunting, but uh, that they proved very useful um, because of, of for one thing. Um, individuals, especially far outside of the uh, central tentacles of Salt Lake City, um, when they find these things, they have a tendency to um, expose them very quickly to where they can't be so easily redacted. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of things have made it out there into the public space without certain organizations being able to cover them up. So for that, I always thought that was really great. <clears throat> of course, I didn't think that we were going to agree on origins at the time. Uh, however, you know, I had not, I hadn't made it my business to say one thing or another about, about Smith, um, and the Book of Mormon and all of that at all. Okay, so when I approached this, it, it was not with these preconceived notions that Smith was a, a, a crazy man or a charlatan or anything else, okay? If, if I were to tell you what it was that led me here, it would be the spirit because I didn't really have any other reason to, to start this um, other than a great interest when I saw that somebody from within uh, Mormonism and a high-ranking uh, member at that is writing about Smith's connections with Kabbalah and it was a real head-scratcher and definitely something that I thought I really had to get into. Now the one thing I did want to comment on is since I started this series and, and actually before because I have mentioned for those who are interested and there are a number of, of you that are interested about uh, my cancer treatment okay I've made posts on it um, and I've so far encountered not only uh, through comments emails other types and forms of contact a lot of people either in a way that's, of course, intentions are very benevolent. So I'm not faulting uh, a, a vast majority of, of people's intentions. Um, suggestions of various uh, alternative therapies and techniques. There's a couple of things I want to say about that. Now, that's not been the only... Uh, sort of comments and contact. I mean, I've I've had I've had comments, literally people telling me I'm stupid for getting chemo. So I I don't know if any of the people who say brilliant things like that actually think I'm going to pay any attention to what you have to say or not. If you do, then you're dumber than I thought. But I just want everybody to consider something. I've tried to make this clear. Uh, I had cancer for years. It was developing and growing, and my body was slowly, for a long time, disintegrating under the, the weight of it. The last six to nine months, um, because of a procedure, it had become far more rapid. And by the time I started chemo, I was, I would have, had I not started chemo, 
and I waited. I would be dead before long. I developed a condition that was simply a complication to how much cancerous tissue had built up on lymphatic cells, lymph nodes. That would have killed me. There isn't a technique or alternative therapy that I have seen somebody uh, name to me yet that I haven't heard of or tried and not a little try not a try for a few days really tried when it's your life most people tend to really put their best foot forward and um, and really give it a good go and I did uh, there's just something I, I want people to consider Every person thus far who has recommended something to me in, in this spirit, <clears throat> remember, not talking to everybody who has tried to give me advice on things that might be helpful. I am talking about the people who make absolute statements, <laughs> who say, you should do this for your cancer you should do this you ought to do that this works I wanna know how many of the people who have said that or have given advice like that to other people have had the kind of cancer that those people have had or you personally and I mean you personally known and experienced somebody with that exact cancer who used that exact technique therapy or whatever that you're recommending and have proof that that is what cured their cancer how many we may not like that medicine today in the US is absolutely monopolized by allopathic techniques and the AMA which is controlled by big pharma we may not like that I don't like it but you have to understand something I hope you'll be willing to think past look past um, what seems to be the obvious superficial answer since so much has been made available information wise uh, on social media and just on the web in general there is a lot of good and helpful information out there the big pharmaceutical companies allopathic medicine in general the establishment know that they have absolutely no intention of you me or anybody else dethroning them with homeopathic alternative inexpensive treatments for things like cancer which is a huge huge multi-billion dollar industry and that's just cancer that doesn't doesn't account for all kinds of other um, disease problems and things that are killing people or murdering people so I want you to consider the very strong possibility based on all of the other disinformation that we've seen out there on a slew of topics do you not think that it is the establishment themselves who are putting out all of this information not all of it a good deal of it 
it works to their advantage. First off, the people suffering from these things, they're not going to get cured or healed, and they'll just be back in their arms and maybe worse. But secondly, like with a number of things that we've seen lately, even legislated now, Legis I hate to call it even legislation because some of the laws that they've passed, they're not laws, they're codes. That's not law. What they pass off as law. And don't you treat it like law. Just because a bunch of people decide they have the power to pass something that they want to call law, and it's not law, not if it's passed by the corporate United States, it is not law, that is just code. That is not moral and it's not law. However, under the auspices of law, they're going to use things like this to control the narrative. A Hegelian dialectic. They cause the problem. And they will pose the solution. And then they still win. You get how they work? So if they're putting out all kinds of garbage in the form of good, positive information, alternative therapies and cures, my advice to you so that this doesn't hurt somebody and it doesn't hurt you because they're using this and they're going to continue to use it to hurt us, to hurt people you care about. My advice would be to not tell people that they should do this or that or the other until you are willing to put in some serious time doing serious research. And I don't mean listening to people who claim to be experts on YouTube or a podcast. I mean, you yourself take the responsibility of looking into these things for real and finding hard, hard information, factual results, empirical studies and results before you present something as a cure or a relief to somebody who is either very ill or dying. Okay, so <clears throat> with that being said, uh, as I told you in the last installment of this series, um, I am going to go through uh, brief Bible passages as I go. And here's why. Because a lot of this stuff and other subjects can get to where they, they seem pretty dark. And there's no reason why we have to look at what is going on as dark. And the reason is, is because if we really do have faith in our Aliyam, our God, and we really do have faith in his Christ, Mashiach, and we believe his words, then there's no need to fear. But I certainly do understand the weight of a lot of these things. It's heavy. It weighed on me for so long learning these things, and a lot of it still does. It weighs on you. There's no getting around that. You know, he who increases in wisdom also increases in sorrow. That's just a fact. We, 
we get warned that before we go in. So, it's good to, to begin with the Word. For one thing, it has a cleansing quality. And for another thing, it has a quality of hope and keeping our spirits up. So, the one of the parables that I went over today, because I've been going over parables lately, uh, as just part of my general study, okay? And I'll start... I'm going to be in Matthew because in Luke, it's also in Luke, you, you don't get the same type of, of explanation. Um, but it, it's in Matthew uh, 13, 24. And I suppose, I was going to read from KJV, but I'm going to read from World English Bible. Um, because it's easier for the hearer to listen to and understand. So in Matthew 13, 24, it reads, He said another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people slept, his enemy came and sowed darnel weeds also among the wheat and went away. But when the blades sprang up and produced fruit, then the darnel weeds appeared also. The servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did these darnel weeds come from? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, Nope, lest perhaps while you gather up the darnel weeds, you root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until harvest, and in harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, first, gather up the darnel weeds, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now a little later, it says in verse 36, Then Yusho sent the multitudes away, because he was speaking to multitudes at this time, and he went into the house. His disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the Darno weeds of the field. He answered them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. The Darnell weeds are the children of the evil one, Diablos. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. Well, actually, evil one's not Diablos, sorry. Is the devil, that's Diablos. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the Darnell weeds are gathered up and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all the things that cause stumbling and those who do iniquity. And I will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the traditional way of interpreting this, I'm sure all of you have heard it interpreted this way by a preacher or someone, is that, well, this is talking about um, all of those people who are really, really Christians, and then the Darnell weeds, and that's a different word, actually. The word there, I'll go to my KJV+. Plus, and what I'm going to be giving you is, is roots here, okay? Um, the root is said to be zizanion. Now, it's interesting. Zizanion, you can even look it up in a Greek lexicon. They'll say its origin. Well, its origin, um, we believe, is, and they give another word. And actually, the word that they give for, oh, I don't have that document up. Darn it. They give a different word. Um, I believe it's um, zone, 
which actually is a verb to boil. And they say that this zizanion is from that, but they, they really can't draw clear connections, so they're guessing. The word is zizanion. Now, the thing is, there are a huge amount of Obri words in the New Testament that have been transliterated into Greek sounding words. It is my current opinion that for one thing, Zizanion is one of these, and it comes from the Obri word tzitz. And tzitz has quite a lot to do with growing or flowering. Now, in many translations, like the older ones, King James, you'll see it's tears that they put in here. And the newer ones, like I just read from, they'll put in Darnell wheat. Okay, now first off, the Greek word Zizanion does not mean Darnell. So they're inserting Darnell. Darnell is an actual plant, and Darnell looks exactly like wheat. Uh, until you get up close and examine it, and then you see that it is not wheat. It is a type of weed, uh, and thus is parasitic. However, may I please provide um, what I more believe is going on here. The word being Zizanion, and if it is in fact from the Obri root tzitz. Tzitz is flower or flowering. Um, and that being so, since I haven't done an extensive study on it yet, I'm currently listing all of the words that I find to be either overtly Obri or quite possibly Obri words. Um, I am listing them for what probably will be an extensive article I'm trying to do, um, or a series of um, blogs. Anyways, then what would actually be growing among them would take on a different aspect in the sense of the flowering of it. Do I know exactly what that means at this point in time? I don't. But it's a bit of information that I thought I would at least share. If you see something like Darnell, that's not necessarily the case. If you see tares in general, it means weeds. And in a sense, that's good enough. However, if this, if this word is based on an obri root, and we can determine what that is, then the meaning of all of this is going to be that much clearer to us. So I do think that is important. Now the sower of the seed is Bani Adam. That's what he referred to himself as. Bani Adam, the son of Adam. He says that the field is the world. The good seed they're the children of the kingdom. But the Tzitzanion, Tzitz, they're the children of the wicked one, Paneros. Now, what I find is really interesting are two words in here. He says, The enemy that sowed them is the devil, Diabolos. And the reapers. He says, the end of the age. Don't pay attention to King James. It's the end of the world as we know it. Aeon, age. There are ages. By faith we know that Yahweh framed the ages. The end of an age. The reapers are Agalos. Now what's interesting about <clears throat> this Diabolos um, a lot of people would tell you, of course, that Diablos is the equivalent to the uh, Old Testament Shatan. 
And that may be the case. In Revelation, it says the serpent is Diabolos and Shatan, known as Diabolos and Shatan, right? So we've got that. Interesting. If that's the case, I've mentioned in the past how Shatan is used in the Old Testament. It, it doesn't even show up until Numbers. Numbers 22, I believe. And in that sense, it's actually the Malak, which is actually the Obri equivalent of what we see, Agalos. And also, Malak is a messenger. Yes, there are the Malak of Yahweh, but there is also Malak, a messenger. He can be a messenger of a king, a messenger of a peasant, a messenger. Agalos, same thing, actually, a messenger. What's interesting is that, for one thing, this um, Diabolos, it is not used only in passages where, let's say, a mighty powerful individual spirit being, as we've been told this Satan Lucifer character is. It's used for people. Um, Yusho used it when speaking privately with his disciples, and he said, Did not I pick all you twelve, and one of you is Diabolos, Diabolos, whichever way you want to say it. It is used for various people, just describing their characteristics throughout the New Testament. Interestingly, diabolos, the, uh, the prefix, the dia, um, sort of, uh, I guess the best way, uh, by way of bolos, to cast, throw, or spread. So if you see, they cast their nets, bolos, by way of casting, throwing, or spreading, dispersing. The really interesting thing is, if you look at <clears throat> G32, agalos, I think I have it up right here, it'll tell you, <laughs> I, love, I love how concrete they are about things, I'll say probably from either... Um, Ago, G71, or um, Agela. Now, this whole Agela herd, kind of interesting, but the Ago, to bring lead or bring forth. Um, in fact, I think I clicked on it before I started this, and they had an expanded definition. Um, there's almost a, a strange contrast between uh, Diabolos and Agalo. One, in a sense, more chaotic to scatter. And a lot of people would actually say, well, no, that's the reason that it's translated as accuser, because he throws ac accusations. Okay. Maybe. Um, whereas Agalos, I think, has far more of a connotation of, <clears throat> let's say, the difference between chaos and order. Uh oh. Look at that. I just went offline. <laughs> However, either way, <laughs> with Diabolos and Agalos. One thing that needs to be clear, just like I pointed out with Diabolos, with Agalos, that is also used of people. You can see a distinction with, um, for instance, you know, the uh, Agolos of Theos, right? The angels of God. But it's also used of people as messengers, as emissaries. So what's interesting to me is that, that it, as it goes forward, and Yusho says, uh, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, 
uh, so shall it be at the end of this age. The Bani Adam shall send forth his Agalos, and they shall gather out of his kingdom, gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And they shall cast it into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, what interests me is this. So they're, they're going to cast up, I'm sorry, gather up all of the things that offend. First off, things that offend. And them which do iniquity. And this anomia, them who, they who do lawlessly. It's lawlessness, okay? Lawlessness. And then scandalon, scandalous. Things that are scandalous, and they which do lawlessly. And will cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So they're going to all throw them into eternal, conscious, flaming, horrible torment in a place called hell. Or, since he's speaking in symbols, and right here at the end, he doesn't tell them the meaning of these symbols. But we do know that fire is used throughout the Bible for purification. Purification of the saints, purification in general. We'll cast the things that offend, scandalous, and they which are lawless into a furnace of fire for the purification of the kingdom. The kingdom will be purified at the end of the age. He will send out his agalos, his emissaries. Now, I'm just going up a little bit. The reapers are the angels. Now, if I cross-reference that, Do, do, do. Well, I wish they would give me the right cross reference. Yep. Not there. Here's my point. He doesn't say Agalos Theos. The Reapers are angels. Agalos. So shall it be at the end of the age, Bani Adam, send forth Agalos, they gather out of the kingdom all things scandalous, and they which do lawless, cast them into a furnace of fire, which is purification. There will be wailing and gritting of teeth. It will not be a good time. It will not be an easy time. It will not be a painless time. There will be wailing and gritting or gnashing of teeth. So are we talking about the fires of an endless, tormentous, burning hell that we can't find taught in Scripture? Or are we talking about a purification that is going to happen in the kingdom? A purification. And by who? And then he says, and then the righteous, they'll shine forth as the sun in the kingdom, which harkens back, of course, to Daniel 12. Yusho is said to be <clears throat> the firstborn of many brethren. It says that he has, through what he has done for us, given us the ability and the power to become Bani Aliyim, sons of the living God. He has recreated man. He's recreated man. If if we continued in in some state that 
that continually affirms a nonsensical point of view that we cannot rise above because of him, because we're full of his spirit, and attain unto great righteous deeds, then we're not paying attention to the Bible. The Bible says that those who are his, that those who have his spirit, that those who ha he has made possible to become Bani Aleim, shall do all kinds of great exploits. And again, it says that in Daniel 12, that they would do all kinds of great exploits. There is a reckoning that is coming in the kingdom of Yahweh, where all things will be burnt up, all things scandalous, and all them which practice lawlessness. The end of the age, and it is absolutely something for everyone to look forward to with great hope and, and great aspirations, and we can rise to it because not because of who we are or our flesh or anything like that, because we have been given the spirit of his son. He has sent it into us, thus allowing us, because of what he did and who he is, to become Bani Aleim, sons of the living God. Just like it says in Hosea 1.10, that they would be like the sand of the sea and in the location where it was said unto them, not my people, they'll be called Beni Alayim, sons of the living God. And you know what? The whole creation groans and waits for these sons to be revealed. So, now that we have hope, let us continue with the last brief sections from Mr. Lance Owens on Joseph Smith and Kabbalah. And um, we're not going to see, we're not going to see majorly new revelations in this last couple of sections, but we're going to see a continuation of a pattern that we are going to discuss more in depth as time goes by as things get really interesting and heated up. In the section Kabbalah after Joseph, colon, a legacy misunderstood, Mr. Owens writes, Kabbalistic theosophy was, if nothing else, complex. Different interpretations abounded amongst Christian Kabbalists removed from the original Kabbalistic foundations of Jewish culture and halakhic observance. We can imagine how easily such ideas might have been misunderstood by a concretely minded Yankee disciple of Joseph Smith. This may help explain a troubling conundrum of early Mormon theology. Brigham Young's assertion that, quote, Adam is God, Brigham claimed that Joseph had taught him this doctrine although there's no evidence that Joseph ever publicly avowed such a view. In Kabbalah, the theme is, however, prominent. Adam Kadmon is indeed God, in quotes, and his form is in the image of a man, as noted earlier. Given the evidence that Joseph did know some elements of Kabbalah and had access both to the Zohar and to a Jew familiar with a wide range of Kabbalistic materials, it seems probable that Brigham heard this concept in some form from Joseph. The Adam-God doctrine may have been a misreading or a simplistic restatement by Brigham Young of a Kabbalistic and Hermetic concept relayed to him by the prophet. Now we are going to see in very short time as we go forward that there's a very good reason why Brigham Young would be able to make assertions like that Joseph Smith taught him that. Um, did Joseph Smith teach Brigham Young that Adam Cadman concept? I don't think so. In fact, I believe that Kabbalah taught Brigham Young the Adam 
Cadman concept. And I think there's so much here that doesn't yet meet the eye. But it will, just like last time when I read from Luke 8 and verse 17, was it? That all things that are secret will be revealed. Because when we light our light, we don't put it under a bushel or under a bed. We put it up on a stand so that it'll shine light on everything, both truth and error. Now, Owens continues, More than one element in early Mormon theology suggests that subtle visions could be made grossly concrete. Perhaps the most striking example is, sacral, is the sacral nature of marital sexual union and the human potential for multiple sacred marriages, a potential shared in Joseph's time by both women and men. If I had a record playing, I would scratch the needle across the record and stop it at this point. I have been, in the last week, reading a number of eyewitness accounts concerning a lot of stuff that was going on between, mostly between Kirkland, Nauvoo, and Salt Lake. Um, and for Owens to say something like shared by both women and men is deceitful. Okay, the, the women, uh, I think, were the last people that shared uh, this idea. Or, you know what? If the women held to the more ideal aspects of this idea, it certainly wasn't in the coarse way that Smith and his inner circle practiced it. As Bloom noted, now Bloom is this Jewish author who wrote a book called The American Religion, in which he goes over a number of different religions. Um, it's definitely a work that I plan on getting my hands on. He says, as Bloom noted, uh, in Kabbalah and perhaps in Smith's practice, uh, quote, the function of sanctified human sexual intercourse essentially is theurgical, unquote. That's important. The function of sanctified human sexual intercourse essentially is theurgical. Yes, they looked at it in the same way as guys who, who came a hundred years after them, like Aleister Crowley, would look at it. Theurgical. Magical. Sex magic. Sure. Anybody who's not looked into Crowley and his actual practices, you know, Anyways, all right, <clears throat> this was an important, I'm um, sorry, this was an important underdone in the wider circles of Christian occultism. Importance, I think he meant to say. Eventually manifest in several occult Masonic societies. How Joseph interacted with this tradition and vision is the single most interesting and important issue awaiting historians of Mormonism, because they're going to treat it fairly. <laughs> All right, that this was an issue early in his life is witnessed by the need to marry and have Emma with him prior to obtaining the golden plates of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> that the preoccupation persisted throughout his life needs little argument. What a way to glaze that over. Ideas of sacred sexuality permeated Kabbalah, Hermeticism, and alchemy, perhaps touching even the mystical vision of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart in his overtly Masonic opera, The Magic Flute, quote, Man und Vib, Vib und Man reichen an die Gottheit an, or Man and Woman, Woman and Man, together they approximate the Divine. By investigating in depth the legacy of ideas and experiences of Kabbalah and Christian occultism, we might begin to understand this perplexing vision shared by the prophet Joseph Smith. Now, Owens, of course, is alluding to Mozart being a Mason. Does anyone out there have any, not hearsay, 
Does anyone out there have any good documentation, and I mean witness or something to that effect, that Mozart was in fact a Mason? I don't want to hear the hearsay. I want to know what is there out there, either direct eyewitness testimony, something. Because I've heard this bandied about a lot by a lot of people about Mozart. I really would like to know. He continues, that Kabbalistic ideas persisted among Joseph's disciples is suggested in an intriguing piece of evidence appearing three years after the prophet's martyrdom. To understand this item, a more detailed understanding of Kabbalah as Joseph may have heard it is necessary. Briefly summarized, the most important symbolic representation of the structure of the kingdom of God in quotes is Kabbalah, was the, oh, I'm sorry, in Kabbalah, <laughs> was the tree of Sephiroth. The tree was redrawn by Robert Flood, an important English Kabbalist and Rosicrucian of the 17th century, in a slightly different fashion. See figures 12. <clears throat> For those of you who are not looking, it is similar to what you would see that the tree of Sephiroth is uh, as it's represented in Kabbalah. It's more symmetrical, consisting of circles and thick lines between the circles having their various connections. He drew it not as a circle but as an inverted tree, literally a tree upside down with what looks like feathers, but I say are palm branches at the bottom acting as roots, and roots at the top acting as branches set in front of a glowing either sun or I would say maybe moon, since the sky all around it is black. This is what Robert Flood drew. In his figure, and he's going to describe it a bit as, as well. Flood uses an allegorical image of a tree with roots in heaven above and palm-like branches at the bottom. In the Sephiroth of Malkuth, meaning foundation, extending into the earth, the tree is crowned, the crown representing Kether, meaning crown, the first Sephirah, and primal God image. Below this crown, the tree branches into the other nine Sephiroth. In Latter-day Saints' Millennial Star, in 1847, an interesting figure appears titled, A Diagram of the Kingdom of God. The artist and author of this piece was probably Orson Hyde. Hyde's tree is also crowned, and branches in precisely the fashion of Flood's tree. The only difference is that Hyde, Hyde's tree has 22 branches. This is a remarkable choice of numbers, as any student of Kabbalah will recognize. In Kabbalah, there are two important numerical aspects of the tree of Sephiroth. The first is the number 10, the number of Sephiroth. The second is the number 22 the number of paths between the Sephiroth, one for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Thus Joseph Smith may have conveyed to one of his apostles, or Hyde may have independently found compatible with the prophet's teaching, the most essential symbolic element of Kabbalah, the mystical shape of the Godhead, contained in the image of the Sephiroth, as redrawn by a principal and very influential 17th century Christian Kabbalist flood. And in the drawing they show, <clears throat> bit different, but uh, as he said, would seem to have these 22 branches. Um, so, you know, you can go along with Lance Owens, the uh, high Mormon bishop insider apologist um, who is very cleverly and craftily controlling the narrative and say that, gosh, must have just been an extension of those powerful teachings of Joseph's and maybe that article that um, Nybauer had written or 
if he wrote more than one. Or it's just an archetype. It's an archetype that comes with some sort of, of pure prophecy. Or what about what about the possibility that Mormonism from its foundations, that means the Smith family, their associates, and uh, happenings before the Book of Mormon was ever produced, um, was all Kabbalistic, and that Mormonism was full of Jews and Masons from the start and throughout supporting and nurturing and growing that organization in a Kabbalistic, Masonic, Jewish way. That's a possibility too, but Owens never mentions that possibility. I don't know why. He continues that interest in the subject of Kabbalah or Kabbalah I haven't decided which way I want to pronounce it. I know that <clears throat> most Jews, when they pronounce it, they say Kabbalah, not Kabbalah. So I'm kind of torn. That interest in the subject of Kabbalah and Hermeticism persisted in at least one disciple of Smith's as witnessed by William Clayton. Clayton was Smith's personal secretary and one of his intimate associates during the prophet's last years in Nauvoo. Few, if any, individuals had a closer view of Joseph Smith in the Nauvoo period. This may explain Clayton's otherwise unusual interest in Kabbalah and alchemy manifest in his later years. In 1864, someone in Utah loaned Clayton a guidebook of Kabbalah. Somebody. <laughs> they just had it. Handy. A tract apparently containing several advertisements for esoteric materials relating to Kabbalah and alchemy. As one of Clayton's biographers writes, quote, Though the record is not clear, it may be that he wanted something akin to the so-called philosopher's stone of the ancient alchemist, a substance that supposedly enabled the adept, when applied correctly, to transmute metals, unquote. Clayton subsequently organized an alchemical society in Salt Lake City <clears throat> with himself as corresponding secretary and purchased several mail-order alchemical outfits. The group, which numbered at least 26 members, spent months attempting to transmute metals without success before finally abandoning their project. Though it appears Clayton was simply duped by a mail-order shyster, his esoteric interests and his faith in them might also be explained by some recollection he harbored about Kabbalah and the prophet in Nauvoo. Yeah, that's right. That's right, Mr. Owens. Clayton was Smith's personal secretary. He was in the inner circle. And yet, he was pretty fuzzy about ideas like Kabbalah. He was pretty fuzzy about alchemy and that alchemy didn't have anything to do with literally transmuting lead into gold. It had everything to do with secretly changing goodness, goodness into darkness which they would call imperfect man into their perfect man. I mean, I thought that that was like basic, uh, in the basic introduction to the occult and alchemy 101. But you think he got 26 guys together and started this alchemical society in Salt Lake City, and they got duped by an advertisement in some Kabbalistic book, which somebody just happened to have. I got this, uh, this week I got the Sears Roebuck, and uh, I got the Kabbalist Review. You want to borrow it? Got some good ads. Alchemy kits. <laughs> All right, so that section is concluded. The last section is the conclusion. 
Joseph and the Occult Connection. He writes, In attempting to understand Joseph Smith and his religious vision, historians have examined both the religious sparks kindled by his time and the so social soils from which the young prophet sprang. As useful as some of these efforts have been, I still agree with Paul Edwards. Our methods so far have been too traditional and unimaginative, in quotes, to comprehend Joseph's history. We remain even now blinded by the fears of yesterday, or biased by its erroneous judgments. Chief among the subjects that might be feared in Mormon history is Joseph's apparent recurrent association with the occult traditions of Western spirituality. <clears throat> and this remains the area of history least examined and understood. It is impossible for me to present fresh evidence which seemingly links Joseph Smith to what might be interpreted as the occult without addressing this wider issue. The historical record witnesses that Joseph Smith had some intercourse with at least three important manifestations of the alternative and non-orthodox religious traditions that blossomed in the Renaissance and post-Renaissance period, traditions sometimes labeled as the occult, ceremonial magic, masonry, and Kabbalah. These associations extended throughout his life, and his liaison with each constituted more than casual acquaintance. This is an area of history to which Mormon historians have been hesitant to turn full attention, an area where our fears or ignorance have del delimited, all right, <clears throat> delimited our understanding. It would be foolish at this date to maintain that any single tradition engendered Joseph Smith's religious vision. Joseph was an American original, and we need not fear him being cast as a Masonic pundit, folk magician, Rosicrucian mystic, medieval Kabbalist, or ancient Gnostic. I mean, I certainly would, but I guess LDS shouldn't. Nonetheless, we must recognize that something in the nature of the prophet, some element of his own intrinsic vision, did resonate with the occult traditions of the Western spiritual quest. Into the spirit and matter of his religious legacy, we wove these sympathies. Joseph carried his silver talisman, inscribed with the sigil of Jupiter, and Hebrew letters cast in a magic square upon his person to his death. He called masonry a remnant of true priesthood, and over a thousand of his men in Nauvoo, including nearly every then current or future priesthood leader of his nascent church, went through the three separate steps of ritual initiation leading to the degree of Master Mason. Got it? In his last months, amid dissension and danger, he found time to sit and read Hebrew and perhaps study Kabbalah and the Zohar with Alexander Niebauer. And in April 1844, when his congregation expected retrenchment and reconciliation, he turned to that Hebrew and bequeathed to his disciples an extraordinary vision of God a theosophical pronouncement which, which echoed the tones of Kabbalah even to the ear of a critic so far removed in time and culture as Harold Bloom. <sighs> Though who knows how much of an actual critic Bloom is. It is this last link, Joseph's sympathy for Kabbalah, which may be the key that finally unlocks a pattern and opens a new methodology for understanding the prophet Joseph Smith. As Richard Bushman noted, the power of Enlightenment skepticism had far less influence on Joseph Smith. Joseph told of the visits of angels, of direct inspiration, of a voice in the chamber of Father Whitmer, 
without embarrassment. He prized the Urim and the Thummim and the Seer Stone, never repudiating them even when the major charge against him was that he used magic to find buried money. His word was not created by Enlightenment's rationalism with its deathly aversion to superstition. The prophet bought into modern America elements of a more ancient culture in which the sacred and the profane intermingled, and the saints enjoyed supernatural gifts and powers as the frequent blessings of an interested God. Cursed is he who calls good evil and evil good. You do not mingle the profane with the holy. This is me talking. Remember what happened to Aaron's two oldest sons who burn strange incense before Yahweh. Joseph Smith did indeed bring into America elements of an ancient culture, but that culture was not temporarily very distant from the prophet. When Joseph was introduced to Jewish Kabbalah in its classic form in Nauvoo, he found, consciously or unconsciously, the fiber of a thread woven throughout the fabric of his life. The magic he met as a youth the prophetic reinterpretation of scripture, and opening of the canon to divine revelation, the Masonic symbol system, all of these were reflections of a heterodox, hermetic, religious tradition that had persisted in various occult fashions within the Western religious tradition for centuries, a tradition of which Kabbalah was a most important part. Call the tradition a cult if you wish. Certainly to survive it was at times, certainly to survive, sorry, it was at times hidden, but do not error by seeing it as simply a legacy of ideas from which the young prophet might pick and choose. This tradition, as is now well accepted by scholars, was driven by the phenomenon of a rare human experience. As interwoven into Hermeticism, Kabbalah was a tradition not just of theosophic assertions, but of a return to prophetic vision. For a millennium or more, perhaps dating all the way back to the suppressed heresy of the Gnostics, men and women within this larger tradition asserted the reality of their vision, and sometimes even used what now seems modern psychological insight in dealing with their experience. Individuals caught in this experience not uncommonly saw themselves as prophets through the force of the tradition, though the force of the tradition sought to maintain a balance in the face of such realizations. Many of them thought themselves kings and queens before God, and some openly proclaimed their royalty. They probed the mystery of Adam and Eve and primal creation. They embraced rituals and symbols and nonverbal expressions of in effable insights. Their sexuality was sacralized, and not infrequently their sacred sexual practices ranged beyond the bounds of expression accepted by the societies of their times. Their most sacred mystery, the great Mysterium Conjunctionis, was sometimes ecstatically mirrored in the holy union of a man and a woman. They authored pseudopigraphic works invoking ancient voices as their own. They told new stories about God because for them God was a living story, and they found their own lives mingled within a story being told by a living God. When Joseph sought a mirror to understand himself, he found reflections in a history not so distant as that of ancient Israel. His story, the prophet's story, lived within the occult legacy of his time. He touched that legacy often, and he saw in it the image, even if dimmed and distorted, of a priesthood he shared. 
Joseph Smith's life reflected the nature of an unusual human experience, and to understand his history we must understand the experience and the context of history. The Swiss psychologist Carl Jung dedicated the last half of his life to elucidating the nature and psychological insights of the Kabbalistic Hermetic Alchemical Tradition. He felt it held the pearl of great price, the treasure forgotten by Christianity in its enlightened Protestant evolution. It was at the Aranos conferences dominated by Jung that Gershom Scholem, the preeminent pioneer of Kabbalistic studies, opened the eyes of Western scholarship to the tradition's import in our own history. Moshe Idol, Sholem's brilliant and independent protege, has subsequently reaffirmed the value of a psychological perception in understanding its phenomena. With insights augmented by Sholem's work, the historian Francis Yates pioneered a new understanding of the vast influence of the occult tradition in Renaissance and Reformation culture. And recently, Harold Bloom, has pointed to its import in the creative vision of more modern times. Perhaps the thrust of this scholarship is now reaching the cloisters of Mormon history. But should that indeed be the case, Mormon historians must understand that they are embarking into a different methodology of history. A prophet's history flows from two springs, one above and one below. Both melding in currents of his life. What story from above the prophet may have heard will remain his secret, the history no man knows. But by turning to the larger realm of prophetic history and its occult legacy, the record of its aspirations, its symbols and lore, and the enigmatic histories of the women and men who have been caught in this unique human experience, we may begin to find a methodology that leads us with new wonder into the unknown history of Joseph Smith. So back to the old ways, I called this installment, back to the old ways. I think Lance Owens, if anyone, I would have to assume, understands I thought a lot over the course of recording these now nine installments of this series, I thought a lot about this paper and why he would publish this paper. It's a lot like the Zohar, Kabbalah. You see, if you want to keep something secret, you can keep it secret. Well, things have leaked in time. There have been there have been various secrets that have leaked out. A lot of things haven't. Um, the rabbis keep the unredacted copies of the Talmud very, very, very secret, don't they? But the Zohar. The Zohar has been, over the years, maybe not a few hundred years ago, because it just wouldn't have been stood for. That's why it has had a history, and many people will say, well, it was, it was, um, pseudepigraphically authored, um, you know, at this time, <clears> the <throat> 1300s maybe, um, 
But the thing is, it has increasingly, let's just say at least from time of the Renaissance Reformation, time, period, which is a pretty good chunk of time. And I don't want to even speculate too much about the Renaissance because of how little is known about it and how many, I think maybe how many bad conceptions we have about it and its time and what the Renaissance really was. So forget that. But five centuries, Reformation on. The Kabbalah, the Zohar, Lurianic Kabbalah, has enjoyed a more and more overt existence, a more and more public existence. Yes, you can definitely trace it through Hermeticism and alchemy and Rosicrucianism, the Enlightenment, Masonry, Freemasonry. Masonry is actually an honest profession, so most times. But today, today you have more and more people that are discussing it so openly. I can only hope that a number of people with eyes to see are going to understand how the Zohar and Talmudic ideas have crept in and, and saturated the church with their mysticism and their ideologies. And when I say the church, I mean the church at large. It was no accident that more and more people down through the ages have done all they can to marry those Jewish mystical, with the, the, the old world Canaanite, Balmalachian witchcraft ideas with biblical Christianity. People who practice Kabbalah will say that the ideas of Kabbalah are harmonious with Christianity. Yusho himself said, Many shall come and say, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. So, back to the old ways. Well, in the next, in at least the next few installments, we're going to see what those old ways were. And how this isn't, this isn't a, an apologetic that's a response to something that was potentially damaging. You know, th this isn't, this isn't just a white salamander letter. But I see this as externalizing what has been there brooding beneath the surface this whole time. What has been the core foundations of Mormonism from the start. They're just externalizing it now. Because it is my opinion, for one thing, what they need is they want, I believe, Mormons that are currently part of that system and as many as they can recruit in to be now as overtly Zionist as possible because they are mustering their forces. They are mustering their forces to build them up to be a, a great army 
of enforcers for their Noahide laws, for their Soviet-style gulag archipelago perversions. Fifteen, sixteen million strong, the LDS boasts, and that's not to mention the RLDS, is it? They're making these ideas more overt. They are strengthening and really pushing out there their Philo Judaism. Back to the old ways. And we'll see the old ways. We'll see what the old ways were all about, what they were about from the beginning. There are still pieces of the puzzle that haven't been answered. But I have uncovered so many bits and pieces that I think is going to shed so much light on this. And um, as I've said before, there does exist within this prison of Mormonism so many of our people that need to come out from her. Not that I would uh, suggest that this is the only Babylonish system, but our people must come out from all these Babylonish systems. Their hearts must come out. Their minds must come out. Their beliefs must come out. They must be purified by the fire, which is the word. They must be purified. They must be filled with the spirit of him who's called Christ. Come out from her, because they want all of you to go back to the old ways. And the old ways were murder. So there I'm going to stop. We will pick up next time in uh, what should be an addendum part two where we will be we will be reviewing everything we know that can be established as fact so that we can proceed to some pretty amazing things thereafter so until next time farewell <laughs>